Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the function of the kidney as a part of our clinical chemistry lecture series. All right, let's get started. Since anatomy and physiology courses are a prerequisite for medical laboratory technology and medical laboratory science programs, the anatomy of the kidney will not be discussed in depth within this presentation. So the drawing on the right hand side of this slide shows the basic anatomy of the kidney and also where those kidneys are located uh, within the body. Uh, so you don't need to memorize the locations of all of these parts in the drawing, uh, it's just here for general knowledge. So it's important to know that the basis uh, for this particular course is the, the basic functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And the kidney is also composed of two different regions, the cortex, which is the outer portion of the kidney, and the medulla, which is the inner part of the kidney. The renal pelvis is a funnel shaped structure where the urine collects before it leaves the kidney. The urine is transported by the ureter to the urinary bladder. And again, you've had anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, and um, for the students in my classes, um, you've already had your analysis already at this point um, within this program. So this slide should just be a general review for you. So I've already said that the basic functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron. There are over a million nephrons in each kidney. So the glomerulus is the blood filtering component of the kidney. The Bowman's or glomerular capsule encapsulates that glomerulus. The proximal convoluted tubule or PCT is the first section, then the loop of Henle, then the distal convoluted tubule or DCT. The collecting duct collects all of the urine. So again, don't focus too much you know, on these two pictures. So this picture on this slide and the picture on the, the first slide. This should just be a review for you. So what is important here is understanding what the kidney does, what can happen when the kidney fails, and how we test for its failure in the clinical laboratory. So the kidney is an incredibly important organ in the human body and therefore important to understand as a clinical laboratory technologist. The kidney helps synthesize or produce something called erythropoietin or EPO, uh, which helps produce red blood cells. Um, so you'll learn more about uh, EPO in uh, the hematology uh, portion of uh, your uh, lectures. Uh, it also regulates the body's acid base balance and electrolytes, helps regulate hormones, and removes waste and toxins from the body. Nitrogenous waste are nitrogen containing waste that form from metabolic processes within the body and we'll talk about those on the next slide here. So the four main nitrogenous wastes are urea, uric acid, creatinine, and ammonia. So ammonia will actually be discussed in the liver function presentation. So I will link that below um, so you can check that out. So we test for these nitrogenous wastes in the clinical laboratory uh, with the exception of urea. Uh, for this nitrogenous waste, we test for uh, blood urea nitrogen or BUN. Uh, so more on uh, these nitrogenous wastes here in a bit. The four main nitrogenous wastes are urea, uric acid, creatinine, and ammonia. Uh, ammonia will be discussed in the liver function presentation. Um, so I will go ahead and link that liver function presentation below uh, under the uh, comments for this video. So you can check that out. So we test for these in the clinical laboratory with the exception of urea. Uh, so for this nitrogenous waste, we test blood urea nitrogen or BUN and more info on this here in a little bit. So what kind of testing do we do to assess kidney function in the clinical laboratory? So uh, there are clearance tests, um, and in these tests, we test the glomerular filtration ability of the kidney. Uh, so we'll talk about this in the coming slides. And then we can also test for accumulation of those nitrogenous waste. So creatinine, uh, blood urea nitrogen, um, uric acid, and ammonia. So let's talk about uh, these nitrogenous wastes. So creatinine is the waste product of the metabolism of skeletal muscle. The creatinine that is present in a patient's serum is proportional to the amount of muscle mass in the patient. Uh, so the more muscle mass uh, a patient has, the more creatinine just at a normal level they're gonna have in their serum. 
It's constantly filtered by the glomeruli in the kidney, and it's not reabsorbed by any of the renal tubules. Levels of creatinine present in the serum rise after significant damage to the kidney. So if you, the patient just starts to have issues with their kidney, their creatinine levels are probably going to be normal. Now, how do we test for serum creatinine? So medical laboratory technologists and medical laboratory scientists can test creatinine levels directly. Uh, the Jaffe reaction is a chemical method for detecting creatinine levels with picric acid. Uh, there's also an enzymatic method for detecting creatinine by using the enzyme creatinase. And then also there's chromatography method. So these are uh, specific tests, but they're very labor intensive and very technically difficult to do. So these uh, serum creatinine assays used to be done uh, uh, solely by hand, and nowadays um, it is done by these uh, uh, clinical chemistry analyzers. The normal reference range for creatinine in an adult male is 0.9 to 1.3 milligrams per deciliter, and females, due to generally lower muscle mass, just in general, um, have a normal adult reference range of 0.6 to 1.1 milligrams per deciliter. Elevated creatinine levels are generally indicative of a renal glomerular disease, uh, but levels can be elevated with necrosis or atrophy of the muscles, strenuous exercise, or uh, in patients that have a very high meat diet. Medical laboratory technologists or scientists measure blood urea nitrogen, or BUN, rather than urea directly. Uh, so this uh, is a waste product of the breakdown of proteins within the body. And so like creatinine, urea is filtered by the glomerulus in the kidney, uh, but about half of it is reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule, or, or PCT. The normal reference range for blood urea nitrogen, or BUN, is 6 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. BUN is mainly considered a test for assessing the function of the kidney, but there are a variety of reasons that uh, BUN may be elevated, including pre-renal, renal, and post-renal causes. Some pre-renal pre causes of ele elevated BUN could be caused by dehydration or shock, decreased blood flow to the kidneys, or if a patient is in congestive heart failure. Renal causes for an elevation include kidney failure or glomerulonephritis, uh, an obstruction of the urinary tract due to a stone or a tumor can be a post-renal cause for elevations and BUN. Neither BUN nor creatinine is a good sensitive test of early damage to the kidneys. A ratio between the two levels can help a physician determine if the patient has a renal or non-renal issue. A ratio of BUN creatinine of between 10 to 1 and 15 to 1 is a good indicator of the patient experiencing disease of the kidney. If just the BUN is greatly increased with a BUN creatinine ratio of greater than 20 to 1, that can give the physician an idea of a non-renal problem. Um, so students tend to struggle with this. Um, so if there is an issue with the kidney, both BUN and creatinine will be elevated. BUN can be elevated in other things, you know, like we discussed on the previous slide. Um, uh, the obstructions, urinary tract obstructions can cause it. That's not an issue with the kidney, right? There's post-renal causes and pre-renal causes. Um, and those would just be, cause the BUN to be elevated and not the creatinine. So if the ratio is greater than 20 to 1, meaning there's 20 times more cre uh, BUN than creatinine, that indicates that there is a non-renal or non-kidney issue. Uric acid is a nitrogenous waste formed from the metabolism of purines. Elevations of uric acid in the blood may indicate chronic renal disease. Um, Uric acid is not very soluble in aqueous solutions and can create crystals in the joints and in the kidney. So the buildup of these uric acid uh, crystals in the joints causes a type of arthritis called gout. Uh, patients experiencing gout will have an elevated level of uric acid in their blood as well. So uric acid is an nitrogenous waste, again, formed from the metabolism of purines. Um, so again, it creates these crystals in the joints in the kidney because it is not very soluble in aqueous solutions. Um, so a, a buildup of those uric acid crystals in the joints um, causes gout, which is a type of arthritis. Um, so if you see on the right-hand side of the slide, um, it shows a description or a picture of 
uh, what gout is. So you see um, this big toe, it's very commonly causes the swelling and painfulness in um, the big toe, like in this picture. Um, it also can be elevated uh, in increased cellular turnover, like leukemia, which you'll learn about in uh, your hematology uh, courses. So the reference uh, range for um, uric acid in normal men is 3.5 to 7.2 milligrams per deciliter, and in females, uh, the normal range is 2.6 to 6 milligrams per deciliter. In addition to testing creatinine, BUN, ammonia and uric acid uh, to assess kidney function, uh, the laboratory can calculate something called a creatinine clearance. Uh, so I've mentioned this on a couple slides ago. Uh, you can test the nitrogenous waste or you can test uh, clearance. So creatinine clearance is a test of the filtration of the glomerulus in the kidney. It assesses the ability of the kidney to remove certain compounds in the blood and eliminate them via urine. Usually, a patient that has a creatinine clearance will have a creatinine level tested on their serum, as well as a creatinine sample done on a 24-hour urine sample. Conveniently, uh, medical technologists or medical laboratory technologists can test the creatinine levels on these samples, and the laboratory information system on their computer computes the calculation for creatinine clearance for them. So this is convenient in the workforce, of course. However, it's necessary for medical lab students to know and understand the correct formula for creatinine clearance. So the standard creatinine clearance formula is as follows. The patient's urine creatinine level multiplied by the total volume of urine in milliliters multiplied by 1.73. And that is all divided by the patient's serum creatinine multiplied by the total time in minutes of the collection period multiplied by the patient's surface area, so the body surface area. So for this calculation, the 1.73 comes from the standard body surface area, or BSA. Um, so for the purpose of my particular class, we'll be using this 1.73 for the calculation. Um, in a clinical laboratory, the patient's BSA is calculated with their height and weight using what we call a nomogram. And, and you can see a photo of a nomogram on the next slide. Uh, because creatinine clearance is usually, uh, use, is usually performed using urine from a 24-hour period, 1,440 minutes can be used in this calculation for the purpose of this course. Um, so for examples on how to perform this calculation, please see my video on uh, creatinine clearance practice problems. I'll link it below in the description of this video. So like I mentioned on the previous slide, so this is what we call a nomogram, and this is how body surface areas or BSAs are calculated. So you take the patient's height in inches um, and draw a line to the person's weight, and whatever BSA value the line crosses is that person's value. Um, so like, for example, I don't know, let's say um, the patient is 220, I'll add 220 centimeters. So like, let's say like a, around 85 inches. Okay, so you would plot here and then say the patient was, I don't know, 140 pounds, okay? And then you would take a roller. Of course, I can't, I don't have a roller here. I'm like literally working on my computer. So this is a mouse. You would draw a straight line between, that's a really, that's a really bad straight line. Let me see if I can do it better. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so you draw a line straight across. And again, you would be used, that's a little bit better. All right, I'll, I'll deal with that. Um, but that's, uh, you would draw a line straight across using a ruler and wherever it intersects here is the patient's BSA. So here's the height and here's the weight. That's a really bad reference because I cannot draw a straight line with my mouse, but you, you get the gist of it. So for creatinine uh, clearance, uh, the patient, again, is usually uh, given um, a 24-hour urine specimen jug uh, to collect a 24-hour urine. Um, so again, this is a collection of all of their urine over a 24-hour period. Uh, when they submit their urine sample to the laboratory, blood is drawn to perform the serum creatinine level on it to put into the equation uh, to produce the creatinine clearance for that patient. So the normal adult reference range for creatinine clearance for male patients is 97 to 137 milliliters per minute. And for female patients, it is 88 to 128 milliliters per minute. So that is how uh, many milliliters uh, per minute of creatinine is being cleared by uh, the kidney. 
Another creatinine calculation for assessing the kidney is called the estimated glomerular filtration rate, or eGFR. This is a calculation that uses their creatinine value, age, gender, and race of the patient. This calculation is only used for patients that are older than 18 years of age. Um, so as MLTs and MLSs, you do not need to know this formula, uh, just what the GFR is and that the normal reference range is greater than 60. So isatin C is a tiny protein that is produced by nucleated cells. It's filtered by the glomerulus and is completely reabsorbed by the PCT or the proximal convoluted tubule. This protein is not affected by muscle, uh, mass, muscle mass, age, or gender of the patient, and is proposed to potentially uh, replace creatinine clearance for the determination of the glomerular filtration rate. So isatin C can also be used as an indicator for transplant rejection on a patient who has received a donated kidney. Alrighty, that concludes our lecture on kidney function testing. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a like, and please remember to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. And as always, if you have any questions about this lecture or any of the other lectures or have any suggestions on other videos that I should cover for you, uh, please leave a comment in the comments below. Until next time.